All right. So get started here. The um seems like everybody was was um, tracking the stuff we were talking about about substitution mechanisms, which is good. The solvent effects is by far the trickiest aspect of it. Um, the rest of it is is sort of okay as long as you understand that it's a, a spectrum in terms of you're always going to get a little bit of both S and one and S and two, um, but we can favor it. And because there's that logarithmic relationship, when I say a little bit of SN2, sometimes it's really a tiny bit and same for SN1. When it's, if you're favoring SN2, like yeah, technically you can still have some go through the SN1 pathway, but it could be at a, you know, favored by 10 to 15 favoring SN2 over SN1. Um, so we really do mean like a tiny a bit. Uh, really it's those secondary carbons um, that that really throw things are where you wind up having a, a lot of mixture and overlap between your your um, possible reactions. The other thing, let me I wanted to look at the um, the quiz questions real quick. So let me pull up Canvas. Um, actually, I think I can do that. Remember, it was yeah. We don't need to log in. I can do that. Hang on. All right, so the one thing I wanted to make, the one mistake that I saw out of the quick glance that I had was in the second problem that it was um, said, draw the intermediate that forms from an SN1 mechanism when you've got the 1-chloro-2-methyl cis, 1-chloro-2-methyl cyclohexane. Um, I wasn't necessarily clear, maybe perhaps I should have said the, the most stable intermediate that forms, because the first thing that's going to happen here, if it's SN1, is leaving group leaves, right? And you wind up making an intermediate that looks like this. But the what I was looking for is the, the intermediate that's actually going to give you your product is going to be the one that happens after it goes through a rearrangement. Because this is a secondary carbocation, right? Right next to a tertiary carbon, which means there's a, a hydrogen behind the board here that can slide over that one. Right, because remember that's what that's what makes those carbocations more stable. More substituted means more stable because you're surrounding it with more um, other bonds that can donate a little bit of electron density to that empty p orbital, make it a little bit more stable. And so, if you have that on a where you have a carbon hydrogen bond next to a um, carbocation, you'll actually slide that hydrogen over. Basically, that sigma bond, the carbon hydrogen sigma bond, is just going to be pulled over there. It's going to kind of smear out to what's in both places. And, but then, because the tertiary carbocation is more stable, you're going to wind up with this. Where, and now that, that hydrogen that was below the ring structure has now been pulled over to where that carbocation was. And that leaves behind a new carbocation here. So it's not like the carbo, and then I just want to make it clear, the carbocation is not what's moving. If that's what the net result is, is it looks like the positive charge moved, but it's actually the electron, just like with all of our mechanism steps, it's the electrons moving and they just sort of drag the hydrogen with it because it's so light. Is the positive charge more straight stable on a tertiary carbon than secondary? Correct. Yeah, so if I go, let me erase this and come back to a um, blank screen here. Um, 
if I redraw this, so let's say this is our carbon that has our, our uh, our positive charge, our carbocation has an unhybridized p orbital up and down, right? And if you have it, it's a secondary carbon, then there's these other carbons next to it. So, but first off, that makes this uh, trigonal planar, right? So we could have another carbon here, and let's say that that's a hydrogen. But this is an sp3 carbon. If it has, let's, um, so then it's going to have another carbon here, another carbon there, and then you got this carbon hydrogen sigma bond. When this carbon hydrogen sigma bond is aligned, and so it's in the, pointed in the same direction, so that they're both both this sigma bond and the p orbital are both in the plane of the port, you can kind of wind up with it sort of smearing out, almost making like a partial pi bond to try and stabilize that halfway empty p orbital. It is an empty p or, um, piece of the p orbital, but that kind of gives it like it's, they call it an occupancy number. It's basically like, um, we treat these orbitals like they all, always all have a pair of electrons in them, right? This basically lets you take that pair of electrons that's in this bond and sort of give some of the electron character here, kind of smear it out like a resonance structure almost. Um, and that stabilizes it because now it's not a completely empty P orbit. Right. And so, but if you're doing that, if you're smearing this bond out, well, then this hydrogen kind of gets pulled along with it because it's so small. It doesn't have much weight to it, right? And so the hydrogen kind of starts like migrating a little bit kind of in between the two carbons. And then you're in a position where, well, if your hydrogen's really in between the two carbons, and this is a tertiary carbon that can have this hyperconjugation happening from three directions, versus only this carbon only can be stabilized from two directions, from this carbon and that carbon. So basically you kind of get, well, this is pretty stable because we're able to stabilize a little bit, but as long as we're dragging the hydrogen halfway over, it winds up kind of like, well, might as well just drag it all the way over and put the positive charge here. And so it's sort of just sort of, it almost like evolves into something new as it's going because you wind up with this intermediate that doesn't look like either of them or looks like both of them at the same time. So then why not make the, more stable carbocation if we're already halfway there. Um, and the other reason that I'm spending so much time talking about this is because I, the other aspect of rearrangements that we didn't really talk about yet is it turns out that hydrogens are small enough that you can do this with hydrogens pretty easily. The next smallest kind of substituent that we might have attached to a carbon is a methyl um, turns out that if we had a quaternary carbon next to a secondary charge, as long as one of those things that's attached is, is a methyl and nothing larger than a methyl group, you can actually wind up with dragging a whole methyl group over and doing a methyl rearrangement as well. We see it most commonly with hydrogens because they're so small, it happens so quickly. And if we have a choice between two possibilities, it's always going to be the hydrogen the smaller one that moves over. But if there is, we had something like, like let's say it was a dimethyl for the same molecule. When that chlorine leaves and leaves behind its, our carbocation there, now we don't have a convenient hydrogen attached here. We just have the two methyl groups. So in this case, you can wind up with the methyl group actually being dragged over there instead, because that goes from being a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation now. And right? so that would look a little bit weird. Um, but that I wanted to bring that up because that is the other time we see, the other common rearrangement we see at this level. Um, 
as we get more comfortable with this, we'll see some things where we actually wind up with, with an entire grain rearranging. So it could get rearranging, it can make it more stable. It could go from a six-sided ring to a five-sided ring, if that is what allows you to make the more stable intermediate. Because then it's not really dragging the whole thing over. It's just kind of like, well, it's already kind of held in position. But for now, hydrogen rearrangements and um, carbon rearrangements or methyl rearrangements are the ones to watch out for. So quiz questions, since they're all relevant, we'll go through these real quick. Um, if SN2 is unfavored in polar protic solvent, is it uncommon in biological conditions? Or there's some not important applications. They've got uh, HSIs moving into the office right behind us. I think they're they're putting in some shelves and stuff. Um, um, it turns out that, that SN2 is common in biological conditions, um, but not on catalyzed. In general, we like we see catalyzed reactions, organic reactions, a lot more. Most of the uncatalyzed reactions that happen in biological systems are typically um, are typically acid based reactions, frankly, because those happen kind of at an equilibrium rate. They're always happening. Um, SN2 reactions happen a lot in biological applications because it's a way to keep your stereochemistry. Right. And so if you have and like glucose has a very specific stereochemistry. And so you don't necessarily want to just have glucose go through an SN1 and lose that stereochemistry because now it's not glucose. Um, and you need all of those enzymes have their specific active sites that are designed around the stereochemistry. So it's it's really common, but just with very specific nucleophiles and typically in a catalyzed situation. Um, because that allows you to sort of keep track of, of your stereochemistry. Um, and we use it a lot in synthetic chemistry for the same reason. If we're trying to make a very specific stereoisomer, we don't want to go through an SN1 because that cuts our yield by half automatically, right? Um, how does changing the geometry of a carbocation intermediate that the geometry of the groups attached to the adjacent carbons in a ring structure? The answer is unless there's a rearrangement, it doesn't. Um, but you still have to think about, so we go back to that same molecule that we had. Um, let's say we were looking at that, that quaternary carbon that went through a rearrangement where you had the two methyls attached here. This carbon going from tetrahedral to trigonal planar is not going to affect anything about these. But the arrangement of these and the rearrangement that can happen is going to have its own specific stereochemistry. Because if we wind up, when we first make this new intermediate, we do want to keep track of that, right? So if we drew the carbon that's facing out towards us as migrating over, it's now sticking up above. And this one is planar now because now our, our carbon pattern is our sp2 carbon is right here. So just in terms of keeping track of what possible stereoisomers we can make, we do have to pay attention to it, but unless there's a difference there. Let me finish this thought and then I'll go, go see if they're going to be doing that a lot or if I can ask them to wait a couple hours. Yeah. Um, we do always want to keep it in place. We'll be paying attention to it, but unless there's a rearrangement, the rest of the ring structure doesn't really, isn't really affected by this carbon being sp2. If there's a rearrangement, then it is. And when it's sp2, now we have to think about, okay, well, now our new nucleophile can come in from below the ring structure or above the ring structure to give us two different stereoisomers. Um, and what if it was the bottom metal group that moved instead of the top metal group? That's going to give us a different R isomer. So we actually, if we went through this pathway, we wind, if we wind up with two different stereo centers, which we will if this reaction continued, right? We'll have a stereo center here 
in a stereo setting. Um, we'll actually wind up with all four stereo isomers because if the top carbon moves over, that makes this one a specific specific R versus S. But if it's the bottom one that moves over, then this one's the opposite because then it would be the one that's going away from us. And so it, it is something we keep in mind, um, especially with rearrangements. But usually you can just keep the rest of the molecule the way it is and not have to worry about it too much. Um, so the next question is how does resonance affect this? The answer is resonance doesn't really affect SN2 reactions at all. Because SN2 reactions are concerted, right? But for SN1 reactions, making that carbocation, one of the first things we did with resonance was to figure out how, how an empty P orbital adjacent to a pi bond can make all those different resonance structures, right? So instead of doing a true rearrangement, a resonant having resonance for your intermediate is also going to affect your products because you could add them on the carbon where you had your leaving group, or you could put it two carbons away where the positive charge shows up in your resonance structure. And we'll get some practice with that too, but that's tying together resonance that we've dealt with in the past. And the fact that now our, we're talking about our nucleophiles that can attack any positive charge but it specifically are attracted to carbocation positive charges because that's an incomplete octet that has just empty space for them. And then last but not least, um, Nikki, this was a fantastic question because that leads into exactly what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, you said you were, you were watching videos and all the videos said, well, always had E1 and E2 tied to SN1 and S SN2. Um, E1 and E2 are elimination reactions. So what do we think the one and the two stand for? Uh, I'll say like the, the SN1 was first order for substitution, right? E1 is first order elimination. And so E2 is second order elimination. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and before we jump into that, I'm going to go check out next door, see what the they were all in a meeting a second ago, so I wonder, I don't know what's going on here. Better be here for a while. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know where he is. I was just kidding. <laughs> Putting up a white pretty much serves. So I told them go ahead. All right. Um, so this was we just a, re a recap on the solvent effects. Just a reminder that if we're in a polar aprotic solvent, our stronger nucleophiles were the stronger base or the weaker acid. But if we're in a polar aprotic solvent, that flips and it comes down more to um, what's the larger nucleophile, and just in terms of size, because the larger nucleophiles aren't going to be stabilized as much by that solvent. Which was one of the other questions, right? Was if you're using ethanol as your solvent and you have if you either have iodide or chloride as your nucleophile file. Well, in a polar protic solvent, we see that, that iodide is a way better nucleophile than chloride, and ethanol is a polar protic solvent. If it was in a polar aprotic solvent, that would switch. We'd expect the chloride to be the better nucleophile. Although there is a, a crossover here, right? Because if it was, how many, what's, does anybody have a calculator out? What's 43 divided by 0 0.04? That's going to be the same as multiplying by 25. So 80, 
hundred. Thousand seventy-five. So that means they're going to wind up being really close if you're in a polar protic solvent because this one gets much better, but it started out much slower than the iodide. It's way it got increased a whole bunch by putting it into a polar protic solvent, but so did this one. It still increased, just not by as much. So that's in that crossover range where they might actually be close to one to one um, or something where you've got a measurable amount of both of them. But just in terms of the raw, like general rules that we were talking about, I wouldn't expect you to have this table memorized or anything. All right, so let's do some practice with SN2. No, these are the ones we already did. And then. Uh, Here's your overall rates or overall review for SN, SN1 versus SN2. SN2 rates methyls faster than primary, faster than secondary, faster than tertiary. And it's exactly opposite for SN1. This one, however, is due to carbocation stability versus this one is based on, on sterics, having stuff get in the way. So they're not inversely proportional because these two mechanisms are diametrically opposed. There's two separate phenomena that operate in opposite directions that are causing them to be inverse rates. All right. So if we're trying to figure out whether something is likely to go SN1 or SN2, in general, we want to look at a couple of things. One, we want to look at where our leaving group is, because the easiest way to determine if something is going to go SN1 or SN2 is if it's primary or tertiary leaving group. If your leaving group is on a primary carbon, is it gonna go SN1 or SN2? Your leaving group is on primary. Should go, it will go in the concerted mechanism, which is SN2. So if our leaving group is on the primary, SN2 is going to go because you're never going to make a primary carbocation. Primary carbocations are super unstable. If it's on a tertiary carbon, we have the opposite. If it's on a tertiary carbocation, or sorry, on a tertiary carbon, we're always going to go SN1 because a tertiary carbocation is pretty stable. And it's never going to go SN2 because you have all that steric stuff in the way preventing your nucleophile from getting in there easily. Right, so it, we really only run into issues when it's a secondary leaving group. And then we start looking at how good of a leaving group is it? What sort of solvent is, are we in? How strong of a nucleophile do we have? So if we're in a polar aprotic solvent and we have, say, cyanide as our nucleophile and bromide is our leaving group. So bromide is our leaving group. That's a pretty good leaving group. Is cyanide a good nucleophile, strong nucleophile? First off, where is it on, on the PKA table? Yeah, 9.1. And then we have bromide is a pretty good leaving group, right? We have a pretty good leaving group. We have a fairly strong nucleophile. Anything with a negative charge really is going to be a real relatively strong nucleophile, especially in an aprotic solvent. And, and DMF and DMSO and acetone 
are most common aprotic solvents. Acetone, we don't use too much because it has some other side reactions that can occur. So usually DMF and DMSO are our most common um, aprotic solvents that we're going to see um, or, or dichloromethane. Dichloromethane gets used as well, DCM, um, because that also, it's not as polar though as these other ones. So it doesn't get used as often. So strong nucleophile, a protic solvent, secondary leaving group, and it's a good leaving group. SN1 or SN2? Probably SN2. Strong nucleophiles favor SN2. And your nucleophiles are going to be stronger if you're if you are not in a protic solvent. So protic solvents in general tend to favor SN1 because you basically are slowing down your nucleophile and giving that leaving group a chance to leave on its own. What would the product look like if it goes SN2? Our nucleophiles to cyanide, which if we look at the, the Lewis stop structure for cyanide, there are, there are two Lewis stop structures you can draw, um, but only one that has the most stable Lewis stop structure puts a negative charge on the carbon. The other Lewis stop structure puts a negative charge on the nitrogen, but then you have an incomplete valence on the carbon. So the carbon is going, the negative charge of the carbon is going to be where we actually have our nucleophilic attack. And so it's going to come in, if it's SN2, it's concerted. So our cyanide negative charge is going to come in from behind the board. And bromine is going to leave coming out towards us. So our new product would be the inverted stereochemistry. All right, how about for this next one? We just have, if this is our reactant, still secondary carbon for our leaving group, right? So that doesn't, we can't just use the leaving group position to determine SN1 or SN2. It doesn't say a solvent in the nucleophile. So what should we assume? Think physically about what this is saying. What's our nucleophile? What's our solvent? Same thing. Same thing. They're both water. Water is both the nucleophile and the solvent in this case. So now we've got a protic solvent, and it's not a charged nucleophile, which makes it a pretty weak nucleophile in a protic solvent. Now, having the solvent and the nucleophile be the same molecule means that the solvent effects don't apply quite as much because it's water is not stabilizing itself. And it is to some extent, but not like it is surrounding a negative charge. But it's either way, it's a weak nucleophile. So weak nucleophile, still a strong leaving group. Do we favor SN1 or SN2? SN1. We don't have a, water is not a strong enough nucleophile that's actually going to be able to displace the bromide. Bromide's a good leaving group, but water is weak enough nucleophile that it's not going to get in there and knock it off itself. So SN1, our multi-step react, our multi-step mechanism. So the first step is bromide leaves, right? We get an intermediate where we're going to lose our stereochemistry, right? 
And now we get sp2 carbon. Which means the water can come in above or below. And remember, we don't usually write our final product as having a charge. So even though our we'll make two intermediates in a row here, we don't need to worry about any rearrangement because moving the charge one one carbon away, it's still a secondary carbon, right? So there's no driving force really to rearrange this and put it to move a hydrogen over. Um, but our first product that we will get. is going to be an oxygen positive charge, right? So this is just lone pair from that water molecule can come in from either side. So this is now an sp3 carbon. So it's tetrahedral again, but because it was planar, we're going to get a mixture of our two products, right? The two our R and our S. And but the final product is basically going to be something round, probably we'll just probably just say bromide, so that it winds up being a nice um, balanced reaction. The bromide can come in, take the hydrogen. The oxygen keeps its lone pair. So our final product here is going to wind up being and again, you can write out both stereoisomers. because we're going to get a relatively even mixture of both of those. Alternatively, you can draw it like this, and, but you have to specify that you know that that's still a stereocenter and that you're going to make it both, um, both stereoisomers. So you can draw it like this and just say R plus S. Which is the same, same thing as drawing both of them out separately. If anything, this makes the balancing look more correct because this looks like you're getting two molecules out of one, but because it's really going to be 50 50 mixture. Um, but I'm not going to be picky on, on grading. Either one of those would be a full credit answer. If I, a lot of times on, on a test, I'll say on a reaction page, I'll say draw the major or draw all the significant products and indicate which one is the major product. If you have two products, they're going to be present in roughly the same amounts. I would want you to say approximately 50 50, right? Because we're not favoring one of these over the other. Although technically, if this one, If we have SN1 and SN2 happening at the same time, if we get a 50-50 mixture from SN1, but then we also have a little bit of SN2 happening at the same time, the little bit of SN2 could make it so it's not exactly 50-50, but it's probably going to be pretty close to, you know, it might be 55 to 45. So I would want you to indicate both of these are about the same or 50-50 mixture, write something like that when you write both of those products. All right, questions on those first two. How about for this last one? Polar aprotic solvent. Is that a strong nucleophile? Oh, 
Not really, right? Where is it on the PKA table? No. That's if it was deprotonated. If it's deprotonated, it's a very strong nucleophile, just like hydroxide. This one's not deprotonated, which means we have to come up the table to where we see it. There's a protonated methanol, which means there's the nucleophile that goes with that pKa. So our pKa here is negative 2.5, which is not all that different than chloride. They're both, this is a little bit better of a base, but not by all that much. So if we have a weak nucleophile, aprotic solvent, not as good of a leaving group, this one's gonna be tricky because this one's gonna be a mixture of SN1 and SN2. And when you don't have something that clearly favors one mechanism over the other, you have to assume that you're going to get both. And this one, we're going to want a, a white, a blank screen to work this out on. So get that bottom one written down. So if it goes SN2, what products are we gonna get? So I didn't write the other, the nucleophile with the methoxy group or the um, methanol as our nucleophile, right? If it goes SN2, it has to go backside attack. And our chloride leaves all at once. So we're only getting, the nice thing about SN2 is we only get one product, right? Because it pre preserves the stereochemistry. There's no rearrangement we have to worry about. At most with an SN2, you have to worry about maybe a proton transfer at the end so that you don't have a charge left over. So our mechanism would just look like that. Are the first step of our mechanism. And then the last step would be deprotonate that oxygen with the positive charge. So we're going to get an ether attached coming out towards us, keeping the same stereochemistry or inverting the stereochemistry. And when it comes to drawing the structures for ethers, if it's a small ether group, as a substituent, a lot of times we'll just write it out in a condensed structure, kind of making that, it's not a true skeletal structure drawn that way. The true skeletal structure would look like, look like that, but in the interest of saving space. And since this was all of this together was our nucleophile, a lot of times we'll see it written like this, because that's that is actually how we name it as well. If for ethers, we use them, we name them using a prefix, like it's a regular branch. Instead of saying methyl group though, we'd say methoxy. So since we name this all as one group, it's not uncommon to write it all as one group. <laughs> all right, let me clear some of this up, leave. So, and again, the question just said, what's the product? Right, so which means we don't need to show all of the mechanism steps. A full credit answer, if, if the primary mechanism was SN2, a full credit answer could just be to write 
this product up here. If, it, if I say draw the mechanism, then I want to see all the steps. And again, it can be advantageous, especially if there's more, if there's two steps in a row, like that second proton transfer, while you're still getting used to it, it can be an advantage to draw the mechanism, give yourself practice, and because that works, you know, it's like showing your order. Um, you know, once you get decent at algebra and gen chem, you don't need to show every algebra step. But if you're still struggling with your algebra, you probably want to, right? <laughs> if it goes SN1, or when it goes SN1, I should say, since it's going to be a, about a 50 50 mixture. Right, this. If it goes SN1, what's the first step? Leaving group leaves. What's the second step? Not quite. Is it, this is the first intermediate that it can make. Every time you make a carbocation intermediate, ask yourself, is there a way I can move one hydrogen to make it a more stable carbocation? Which there is in this case, right? If you can't move a hydrogen, can I move a methyl group to make it more stable? And that's, and again, that's gonna be more rare. Usually, in this case though, we have a hydrogen here. So our second step would actually be a quick rearrangement. Because that's going to give us a tertiary carbocation. And now we can have our nucleophile come in. And then we're still going to have that same proton transfer step at the very end. We need to worry about stereochemistry. Why not? Well, because it could come in on either side of the sp2 carbon. It can come in on either side of the sp2 carbon. And in addition, that carbon no longer is going to have four unique things attached to it because these two ethyls are identical, right? So we have to remember the rearrangement, but SN1 sometimes makes our, our stereochemistry a lot easier um, when it comes to remembering this. Then it's just like before, You can draw your, I was starting to draw it attacking as the nucleophile again, but um, you can draw your arrows as curvy as they need to be to show what you need to show, uh, as long as they're curved to some extent and you're showing electron movement. It's a major thing to watch out for. So final product here is going to be Still adding a methoxy group just on carbon three instead of on carbon two. So, in this case, so I know that the original problem, wait for you everybody to finish writing this down, and then I'll go back to the original problem. Um, the, the original problem which just says predict the mechanism and products for the following reaction. Remember that it's not a binary choice, right? It's a, both can be true at the same time. 
if you don't have something that rules one of your mechanisms out or that indicates that one is clearly favored, answering this question on one, on, I don't think I would write it like this on a test, but if I did write it like this on a test, I would want to say, you know, explain your logic and then follow through and be consistent. Um, you know, I don't, as long as you're consistent, if you pick the wrong mechanism, but then you get the right product for that mechanism, then I only have to mark you down once, right? If you, as long, and especially as long as you're explaining your logic, okay, you, you thought that this variable was more important than it is. And so you picked S and one instead of saying both. I can mark you down one point for that, but then as long as you got the right product for the, uh, the mechanism you picked, I don't have to mark you down for that, right? So explain your logic and then be consistent. Did we get the table for the exam? Um, like a table like I'll have to look and see what I've done in the past. Um, I either will give you this table or I will make it so that it's all, that it's very obvious. Because our halides are always pretty much always good leaving groups. And in a protic solvent, they're bad nucleophiles, right? And so if all of our leaving groups that you're gonna be dealing with on the test are all the halides, then it's not all that critical that you have this, as long as you can recognize what's the other nucleophile. Um, if I do ask any questions that say which side is favored, then I'll give you this. So it's more about knowing how to use this rather than having the values memorized. Um, what I would be looking for if I was grading this one or on a on a quiz would be if you the full credit answer would be I can't rule out either mechanism. They should happen approximately the same amount because I have a weak nucleophile and a okay leaving group. Um, but I'm in an aprotic solvent. So then you would kind of you could say SN1 slash SN2 or do SN1 and show your product for SN1 and then draw another arrow. SN2 gives you this product and say they're going to be approximately equal or both are the, of these are going to be measurable products. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back and talk about elimination at five after. There's, oh, there's one other figure that I'll go through with you that helps understand how these things, how these compete, but I have to find them first. So after break.
All right. So let's bring it back. I'm going to show you a few versions of the same of the same um, of similar figures. I like this version because the the color coding makes it easy to see when they're saying there's more than one thing that could be expected at once. We haven't gone over E1 or E2 yet, we'll get there in a second, but I like it just for showing, okay, this is kind of one way you can sort of visualize how these mechanisms compete is if your leaving group is on primary, secondary, or tertiary, that's going to change what mechanisms we can expect, right? And then is it a strong base in the, or you? We've mostly talked about nucleophiles at this point because we haven't gotten into elimination reactions and bases generally affect elimination reactions because they have to be able to pull a hydrogen off instead of pulling, instead of attacking a partial positive on a carbon. Um, but typically there are, there's sort of like a Punnett square for your nuclei. Most of our nucleophiles can also be bases. So then it's a question, okay, is it a better base or is it a better nucleophile? Is it a strong base or a strong nucleophile or a weak base? So you can have a strong base, weak nucleophile, which is really simple regardless of what um, happens here, we're going to see elimination. Strong base, strong nucleophile. Now we're getting into some competitive reactions. Um, a weak base, strong nucleophile basically means that you're not going to see any elimination only see substitution. So that's kind of what we've been dealing with. We've been ignoring elimination to this point. And if it's a weak base, weak nucleophile, and it's secondary, this one just says nothing happens. This is the other reason I don't like this particular one, because this says nothing about solvent either, right? And if you pick the right solvent, you can get a weak base, weak nucleophile to have reactions happen on primary and secondary carbons. Um, but you have to choose your conditions carefully, and it's likely going to be a lot slower. So the version I like actually is made by um, West Virginia University, made their own version of this chart, where instead of having what weak base, weak, uh, weak base, strong base, weak nucleophile, strong nucleophile, they divided it up into what are the four mechanisms that are competing. And then on this um, the y-axis is the same thing as primary, and they also specify allylic or benzylic, meaning when resonance can play a role. They behave a lot like secondary or, or um, carbons. Um, and then it has some more information about what's a strong nucleophile versus strong base versus weak bases, and we'll get into all of this. Um, but just our last case that we were just looking at was the secondary carbon. We had a weak nucleophile, um, but we didn't we didn't have solvent effects slowing down SN two. So we really are going to have some combination. If we look down here, this calls our an alcohol or water as a weak nucleophile and a weak base. Basically, according to this, basically it would only go SN1 because of how weak that nucleophile is. We treated it like it could do both. We probably would see a measurable amount of the SN2. Um, but the fact that it's a weak nucleophile, according to this chart, is going to dominate. And we can, we can effectively say, um, within sig figs, we'll only see the first order reactions if it's a weak nucleophile. So this is, it's really comes down to having these sort of classifications. And the thing that you'll notice about strong nucleophiles is other than the sulfur ones, they all have negative charges. And the solvent effects are what can take some of these stronger nucleophiles and turn them into weaker nucleophiles, right? If we had um, chloride is a strong nucleophile until you put it in the polar protic solvent. It's in a polar protic solvent, and all of a sudden it's a weak nucleophile. So the hydrogen ions like exactly they surround it and they basically make it more stable where it is and get in the way so they can't get in there and act act as a strong nucleophile. All right. So I know there's a lot of information here, um, but that's part of why this is going to be a really useful study tool. Um, probably when you're studying for the final, you're going to 
I'm not going to say you're going to want to memorize this, but you should be looking at this enough that you can kind of see it in your sleep. Um, and, that, and that actually will also help you if you use the same tool consistently. When you get to the test, when you can't remember something specific, close your eyes and try and visualize this. Where was it spatially on that sheet? And that can sort of trigger you know, your memory a little bit sometimes. All right, so we're gonna, see, there's some more practice here um, that we'll skip for now. Uh, just because we wanna look at these elimination reactions that I keep hinting at, because once we have the full picture, we can really drill down on the individual variables and get lots of practice. Um, so elimination reactions, the net result of an elimination reaction is instead of a substitution where you put a new nucleophile and attach it where the old nucleophile was, or maybe there was a rearrangement. Elimination, you remove your leaving group, and then you also remove a hydrogen from an adjacent carbon. Because if, you're, if your leaving group is leaving and bringing electrons with it, if you have something that can take a proton and H plus off of an adjacent carbon, that leaves an extra pair of electrons on the adjacent carbon. So if you have a, car a carbon ion with extra electrons next to a carbocation that's missing electrons, the natural result is to turn that into a pi bond, right? Because that still fills all the valences there, right? So it's very similar because anything that can take an H plus and act as a base can also act as a nucleophile. That's why these wind up happening at the same time is because by almost by definition, a base is also a nucleophile. It's just a matter of they're not always equally good at both roles. So elimination reactions occur primarily with alkyl halides and strong nucleophiles. We kind of already went through that because a strong nucleophile can also be a base. And just like we saw before, um, there are two types of elimination reactions. There's a first order, which is gonna go through a carbocation intermediate. So the first step for an E1 reaction is, is gonna be identical to an SN1 reaction. First step for both of them is going to be leaving group leaves and you get a carbocation intermediate. And then you might have a rearrangement happen before the second step. Um, but the second step will either be a nucleophile attack or a proton transfer in a new pi bond. And the second order version does the same thing except all at once. So real quick, just to review our alkene nomenclature, we named alkenes the same way that we name alkanes. We just throw an ene on the end. And if there's more than one place where we can put the pi bonds, we specify with a number. We only say one number. We don't say one to two. Um, butene, it's just one butene. Just out of convenience, why specify? It has to be between two adjacent carbons. So why bother saying one and two? You just say the, the lower number. So two butene would be pi one between carbons two and three. One butene between one and two. Um, one example that's not drawn. See if you can figure out what this means. What's one three butadiene look like? A cyclohexene, ethene, one butene. What is butadiene? Two double bonds. So just like dimethyl, and you have to specify where both of the methyl groups were, a diene is a dialkene, and you specify where both of the double bonds. So one three butadiene. look like that. Oh, and a 
runner was do still use cis and trans with alphines because they don't have that pre rotation. Um, the other way we have of, of assigning these is really similar to cis and trans, but it's slightly different and slightly more universal. So, in general, we're going to, when it comes to alkenes, we're going to use E and C instead of cis and trans. Um, and the reason that's a little bit more universal is because that uses the same priority system as our RMS, where it's all based on atomic number and the tiebreaker is you go one step further out. So E and Z applies a little bit more universally and it's the same priority system we've already learned. Cis and trans always refers to where the dominant chain where the longest continuous carbon chain goes regardless of atomic numbers in other directions so they're slightly different they're not entirely interchangeable you can have something that is um where these two line of contradicting each other um, but for e east is these are both coming from german e is for uh entgegen i think anybody speak german in here I have no idea how you spell it, but it's pronounced something like entgegen, which means against. So entgegen and E is the same as saying trans. It's usually the same as saying trans. It means that your highest priority substituents are on opposite sides. Z is, again, German zusammen. I don't know. <laughs> it's something like that. Um, but literally, the, it's the root is it means the same, um, and you can just about see it in there. It might only be one e on there, zusammen, but it might be zusammen. I don't again. I don't speak German. Did I say the root word? Yeah, the same. Um, and the the way that I've seen videos describe this is a really corny way of remembering it is if you say it with a bad French accent, z is for the same side. <laughs> um, your mileage may vary with those either way it's the same general idea except now just, instead of just looking at where the carbon chain goes if there's some contradiction between the atomic number and where the longest carbon chain is E and Z go with that same priority system so we would say that this one if we're using cis and trans our primary carbon chain is all on the same side of the pylon, right? So this would be cis or Z. This one would be trans or E. And here's a case where um, we wouldn't necessarily be able to use cis and trans because cis and trans by definition refer to the carbon chain. If the carbon chain doesn't apply, then you can use E and Z. So E and Z are more universal. Cis and trans are old school and still get used in some places and we still use them for ring structures. Um, but in general, we're going to switch to E and Z. So for these ones, how would, it, would we decide for the one on the left? For the photos, the halogens would be the priority group. The halogens would be the highest priority group, and they're on the same side. So this one would be Z. Here, our halogens are an offset. And remember, we're, we're just doing one and two priority. We don't need to go one, two, three, four for these, right? Because we're just looking at all of the two things attached to this carbon, which is the highest priority. And then on the other carbon, of these two things, which is the highest priority. And then just comparing where they are. So you don't need to assign one, two, three, four. It's just one and two and one and two. So it's faster. If you 
I don't even want to make generalizations. Somebody without using the ENZ system, I'm not even sure what somebody would name this version. Um, because if you said sys, yeah, you would have to be more specific. You would have to say if you weren't using ENZ, you would have to look at this and say with the halogens and the transpositions. Um, specifically, because otherwise, cis and trans is referring to a carbon chain, and that doesn't apply here. All right, so here's just a, a figure of the mechanisms for elimination. And again, they're going to look pretty similar between the stepwise. So this would be our E1, and this is E2. You're just drawing the arrows either all at once or in separate steps. And in both cases, therefore, just like with SN1, if it's stepwise, it's first order in your halogen, in your alkyl halide, and the first step is leaving group leaves. And then the difference is, whereas in SN, SN1, then our nucleophile, we would draw it as coming in and attacking that positive charge. Instead, if we have a base, we just draw it as pulling off an adjacent hydrogen. So it's not the same active carbon. You have two active carbons. That's one of the tricky parts here. And the bond, or the carbon hydrogen bond that's breaking turns into a new pi bond. Because this pair of electrons right here is left behind when the base takes the proton. Carbon's not that electronegative, it's more electronegative than hydrogen. So it's able to hold onto those electrons. And so you get an alkene plus your propagated base and your leaving group. And if it happens all at once, again, same three arrows just all drawn at the same time. Leaving group is leaving at the same time as these electrons are coming over at the same time as the base is pulling a hydrogen. So like, what would be like the initiate that uh, they're all happening at the same time? Like everything has to be in the right place at the right time? Or? Basic, well, so that, that leaving group is always gonna be in the right place, right? Because it's, it's attached. Um, you do need to have these, it, it'll turn out that we do need these things to happen on opposite sides of the molecule for steric reasons. Um, and it turns out also for orbital reasons. We need those electrons to be able to jump right into a pi bond, right? So we need them aligned so that this bond is 180 degrees from this bond. So as this anti-bond starts, um, starts forming, you have it looks a lot like a p orbital, and you're able to sort of move these right into it at the same time. So yes, it does. But on the other hand, it's still just a second order reaction because most of those things that have to be right are all physically attached to each other. So it's just a matter of, is it in the eclipse or is it in the um, anti-configuration? You need the hydrogen that you're going to pull off to be anti relative to the leaving group. And then you need your base to be able to run into it. So sterics will play a role. Our Newman projections will still play a role. Um, OCHEM is both infuriating and really, really satisfying in the fact that we never get to forget anything because it all just keeps stacking on itself. Um, and just so that we have some terminology, um, we refer to some textbooks get a little bit contradictory with these terms. Um, well, anytime you have an active carbon, 
the carbons that are adjacent to your active carbon, we start, we basically start a separate numbering system. It's, but instead of going one, two, three, we don't want to confuse that with the carbon one, carbon two that we got from naming the molecule. So if we have an active carbon, which in this case, we'd say the active carbon is the one that has the leaving group. The next carbon that's adjacent to that, instead of saying that that's adjacent or one carbon away, we call that the alpha carbon. So we just start using the Greek alphabet um, as a way to not, seems, seems silly to say this out loud. We're gonna use the Greek alphabet so that it's less confusing. So, but that also means that there's beta carbons and gamma carbons as well, right? Beta carbon would be not the active carbon, not the alpha carbon, but about one carbon further away. And gamma would be one past that. And we don't really use it past the gamma. Usually anything that's happening, if it's more than three carbons away, it's so far away from everything that it's not gonna wind up mattering. Um, with one exception, we start counting from using the Greek alphabet going backwards to indicate something that's at the end of a carbon chain. Does anybody know what the last letter in the Greek alphabet is? Omega. So that's actually where the term omega-3 or omega-6 or omega-9 fatty acids comes from. Omega-3 fatty acid means it's unsaturated three carbons away from the end of the carbon chain. And omega-6 would be you've got a double bond six carbons away from the end of the carbon chain. So they kind of use the similar, it's not like they actually counted it out. It's the, I don't even know how many letters are in the Greek alphabet. Is it 30? Are there more than in English? I, either way, it doesn't matter. You count alpha, beta, and sig, alpha, beta, sigma um, when you're counting away from the active carbon. And then you use omega to indicate, and then at the opposite end of the molecule, there's this. Um, but just mainly, um, we're doing that. There's going to be a whole chapter on carbonyl and carbonyl alpha carbon chemistry when we get to the third quarter, because being one carbon away from a carbon oxygen double bond turns out to be that's a very reactive place. Um, and we'll actually talk about that slightly. It bring this textbook brings that up with elimination reactions specifically, because there's a third type of elimination reaction that can happen at the alpha carbon relative to a carbonium. So we'll talk about that probably next lecture. <clears throat> All right, so elimination reactions, especially the E2 reaction, are what are called regioselective. So stereospecific and stereoselective mean that, so stereospecific means you only make one stereoisomer. Stereoselective means that you prefer one stereoisomer. So like, you know, if there's cis versus trans, you might favor making trans for stereo reasons, but you still make a little of the cis. We call that stereoselective. Stereospecific means there's only one option. So selective <clears throat> generally means there's a preference, but you'll get both. And if it's regioselective, rather than meaning it's the same, we're going to make favor one stereoisomer over another. If it's regioselective, that means we favor making one product over another, and it, it can be like a constitutional isomer, which for alkenes, can mean is it between carbons one and two or carbons two and three? Right, so it's slightly different than stereochemistry. It is a constitutional isomer. Um, if your beta carbons are identical, there's only one product formed. And actually, this it should say alpha carbons. Again, this is where it gets confusing. Sometimes some textbooks will call the active carbon the alpha carbon. In some textbooks, it's one carbon away from the active carbon is the alpha carbon. Uh, and so I mixed up my terminology here. Um, according to the way we were just describing it a second ago, that would be the alpha carbon here. So when the alpha carbons are identical,
we only form one product because it doesn't really matter which hydrogen gets pulled off, right? Both of our, our alpha carbons have the same number of hydrogens and are, are no matter which of those four hydrogens are base graphs, we're gonna make the same product, right? you're going to get cyclopentene. But as soon as one of these sides is different than the other, then we can wind up making two different products, right? So for instance, for this molecule, we have three alpha carbons, right? Two of them are identical, but the third one is different, right? It doesn't matter which of these two, these two alpha carbons being identical means that our base could grab any one of the six hydrogens that are attached to those methyl groups and we'd get this product, right? However, if it grabbed one of the two hydrogens here, then we get this for this first project, the product, the major product. So we just looked at the statistics. We just treated it like probability. There are six opportunities to pull hydrogens off. Here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. All of those give us this product. And there's two carb or two hydrogens here. So just from a statistics point of view, if everything else was the same, we'd say, well, we should have out of the eight possible hydrogens, six of them give us the same product. So we would expect it to be like a three to one ratio. But opposite of the ratio we actually observe. So that tells us there's some stability things going on in there as well. And it can't just be sterics because sterics would predict that, well, this it should be has less steric strain, we would think, because it has our it has smaller our two group, only two groups. Attached. So it seems like this should be more favored by sterics and by probability. So something else is happening. And it's going to come back to something that we talked about. One of the first things we talked about with, with alkene stability and cis versus trans, I think it was Rob that asked, well, what about sterics? You say, well, you know, having different substitutions will affect stability, but not just how sterics affects. It turns out it's similar to, to our carbocation stability. Having more substitutions around the pi bond makes it more stable because you get that hyperconjugation. Having all of those other carbons around it means those carbon hydrogen bonds can kind of lend some electron density, kind of spread down, spread things out a little bit. So more substituted is going to be more favored. I guess I should say more stable because it turns out there are some ways we can toy with sterics to actually get the less stable alkene as the major product. Um, but in general, this rule is called, let's see if I on the next one. Um, yeah, there it is. Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule, sometimes you see it with T A Y, um, T S E V, and sometimes S I V. It's, it's a Russian name, and so their alphabet doesn't translate one to one to date. 
English. So depending on what translation you're looking at, it will be spelled a little bit differently. But um, Zaitsev's rule it predicts that for an elimination reaction, the more substituted alkene will be formed because that's how you get the more, most stable pi bond, is having more substitutions. Zaitsev's interesting because he, so in the, this is, comes back to the same, I, I don't remember that 18th century Russian organic chemists were all um, dicks, but it seems to be a trend. Um, Mendeleev, right, was enough of a jerk that it took 100 years after he died before that anybody would name an element after him. He was the guy who invented the periodic table. Um, basically, for Mendeleev, they had to wait till anybody who had ever known him personally had also died before anybody would vote to um, put his name on the periodic table. Um, Zaitsev had a rival. He worked similar time frame a little bit later uh, in the 1800s, um, and he worked in a group with a uh, an older student named Markovnikov. And Markovnikov gets his own rule when we look at addition reactions. Markovnikov's um, specialty was addition reactions, which is basically undoing an elimination reaction. Um, Zaitsev was the younger student and Markovnikov said some really, really nasty things about him in front of him when he was defending some of his research. Um, and so Zaitsev actually had some research that contradicted Markovnikov's magnum opus. Um, and he waited until after Markovnikov had published the first third of his, um, his work before he gave him the results so that he could call him out in public rather than just let him correct it before it was published. Um, so, you know, politics has been around in research for a very long time. And it does seem for whatever reason that it's always the Russians um, that have the most, most politics that way. All right, so if we have, anytime we have identical beta or alpha carbons, then it doesn't matter. We're going to make the same product regardless. If there are two possible products, we're going to favor the product that is most substituted. If there are two that are equally substituted, like if you could make the E versus the Z, then typically we're going to make one that minimizes the steric interactions. Um, occasionally, we don't have an option. If your alpha carbon only has one hydrogen that it can be that can be pulled off because we have to keep everything in that anti-configuration. So in the case that our alpha carbon only has one hydrogen and both of these things are different from each other, we actually have to draw a Newman projection um, and arrange it so that your leaving group is anti to their hydrogen so you can see what product you get when you pull the hydrogen off. That's you don't always have to do that. That's like the exception to the exception. Um, for the most part, we're just going to go with Zaid Seb's rule. So what are our two possibilities for elimination reaction for the first one? Well, it's just four carbons, right? Our leaving group is on carbon two. So, Those are our two possibilities, right? Which I guess and the cis version, which of them is going to be favored? So pi bond in the middle. So we'll have some small amount of this. So this will be the minor product. I won't have you, you know, just throw out random numbers. You just say it's the minor product. Um, out of these, is there one that's going to be favored? Less sterics on the top. 
less sterics on the top one. Let's look and let's, we can also, if we write it out showing our tetrahedral structure, our, we need the hydrogen to be anti, but there are two hydrogens attached to this carbon, right? So we can either have up and out towards us, and then on this side, So actually, it's going to depend a little bit on which stereoisomer. I didn't specify which stereoisomer we were starting with, did I? Which means we can't actually know necessarily that we drew this the right way, because it could have these reversed. But either way, the fact we have two options here means that either way that the methyl group is going to be gauche relative to the bromine, but either direction, it means that there's not a whole lot of preventing it from being either cis or trans. If we only have one hydrogen on this alpha carbon, that's when it gets specific and we don't have a choice. We'll only get one of these two options. But in this case, because we have two options, we can put it either um, in the cis or trans configuration. So sterically, it would be favored to put these methyl groups anti relative to each other, right? Because if we rotated it and put this hydrogen down, then we have a methyl coming out towards us and it's gauche to the bromine and gauche to the other methyl. And when we flattened it out, if we pull, pull the hydrogen off and the whole thing turns planar, we'll wind up with them being in this, in the cis configuration then. So cis is going to be the, the minor of the major products because of sterics. So this should be our major, major product. If we get three products, we don't want to say in there, we can predict relatively, you know, how many we're going to get or what the ratio is going to be. A lot of times I'll say, just rank them one, two, three. We just say, these two collectively are the major product and of these, this is the major of the major product. Ranking one, two, three gets tricky. When you, um, when you do that, because if it's, if it's like 70 to 30, but then of that 70, three quarters of it is this. So this is now a quarter of 70%, which would actually make it less than that one. Right? So it winds up getting really kind of hazy if you have to start breaking down percentages of percentages. So a lot of times we'll just say that this whole thing is the major and of these, this one is favored over the cis. Um, it's not in common usage, but it kind of makes sense to say it's the major, major product versus the major, minor product versus the minor, minor product. Confusing to say sounds like a, a Gilbert and Sullivan song or something like that. Very, the very model of a modern major general, major, major product versus the major, minor product versus, yeah. there's, there's a musical number in there somewhere. All right, for the next ones. We have, this is almost the same one that was on the previous slide, right? We have two options that will give us Be more careful with my angles. Make that more obvious. And and again, this is another place where color coding can be really helpful because you can you can make sense to yourself. Okay, and then if it pulls off of this carbon, this alpha carbon will give us. This product. And for these ones, this is actually a well-chosen molecule for this example, because there is no cis trans, right? So there is no major, major versus a major, minor product. What would be the minor, major product? Minor, 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 major product. 
Um, because in this case, there's no cis or trans because, or no E or Z because there's a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. And if, if we switch those two, we get the same molecule, right? And same here, we have hydrogen and a methyl on one side, but then we have methyl and methyl that are identical to each other. So switching the two methyls relative to the other side doesn't change anything either. So which of them is gonna be favored, purple or red? It's Zetsev is one of those things that if you draw out the possibilities, it's really easy to apply it. When you start with a blank page, it can be a little bit daunting to get them um, written. So like a lot of our cases, just start drawing what the possible products are, and then you can pick your, your best product from there. And how about this last one? Well, we have two different alpha carbons. If we pull that hydrogen off, we get that product. So our major product for the last one looks identical to the major product for the one right above it, right? But our minor product is different. Our minor product for the second example had our pi bond over here uh, adjacent to the methyl group. Here, our pi bond is opposite side of the molecule from the methyl group. So subtle difference um, and only a difference in the minor product, not in the major product. And we'll see that a lot, where there's more than one route to the same major product, but the minor products along the way are slightly different. Um, or we can find that there's multiple mechanisms that give us the same minor product happening at the same time, but two the two different mechanisms give us a very different major product. Um, so again, everything that can happen does happen, which makes figuring out the entire the entirety of this system really, really tricky. So instead of the Zaitsev product, the other product, so Zaitsev's rule is the one that says you make the more substituted alkene. So we also call it the Zaitsev product. Um, however, you can make the opposite product. So I think we've talked about Hoffman before, right? Um, except that there's a poor German organic chemist named Hoffman. They all spell their name differently. This is one F two ends. The Hoffman we talked about before, I think, was two Fs two ends. Um, I think they all won Nobel prizes, which also makes it really confusing. <laughs> all different people, different families. One F two ends. This Hoffman product. Um, is, refer is the less substituted product. It's occasionally, again, you can have more than one Hoffman product in, um, that are similar substitution. But why this is interesting is because we can actually, one, even with a strong base, we still get, it's not like SN1 versus SN2 where one dominates to exponential degrees over the other. These are pretty small differences in energy. And so you wind up at equilibrium making relatively close to the same amounts. And the other thing that's interesting is that we can tweak this by changing what base we use. If we use a big sterically hindered base, like this is um, the, we usually just refer to as TBUOK or terp-butoxide. Um, if 
we use a big sterically hindered base, we can actually get the opposite to happen. And so basically this allows us to favor the sterics rather than the alkene stability. Because the alkene stability differences in energy are pretty small. I think it remembers like four kilojoules per mole. When we looked at, at um, cis versus trans or having them more substituted or less substituted. Um, that's a pretty small difference in energy. And so just changing how sterically good the base is means we can flip these ratios. And if we get a large enough base, um, then we can actually get it to be a you know, nine to one ratio the other way compared to data sets we'll predict. All right, so um, I'm blanking on this B. Uh, per, uh, I would actually have to look up what the common name for that one is um, because it's less common than the T-butoxide. This is butoxide because there's a total of four carbons attached to it. This one has six attached to it, but it wouldn't just be hexoxide. It would be something different. Um, these are the other common sterically hindered bases. Diisopropylamine, triethylamine. Those one, no, those ones don't have a negative charge though. So unless you depropylate them, they're not as strong of a base. They're sterically hindered weak bases. If you depropylate them, then they're sterically hindered strong bases. So going back to that that figure when we came back from break, that's going to wind up making a difference, right? So we'll end there. Um, and that way everybody can get to their, their break for before lab, because we have lab today. Um, today's lab will be fun. Um, we get to use some natural products. We're going to extract lemon oil or clove oil. And I think we'll probably all have, have everybody do, assuming the Zeke's not going to take it. Um, we'll probably three setups. Everybody do their own because this is a, this is one that's um, you know have everybody having their own getting more product is going to be more favorable for us. So stop there. We'll pick up with with uh, elimination reactions and more practice with these on Thursday.